Welcome to another episode of Design on Purpose, the podcast where we talk about our vision, which is planet Earth as a garden and work about for a life. And uh, today I'm very excited to have our guests on the show at Pure Jaguar. We're just talking about that. <laughs> yeah, the handle. Jaguar. Jaguar, Pure Jaguar, whatever. Yeah. And suddenly. Yeah, you're welcome. So yeah, I've, I've was quite excited because I put a post out the other day, um, just to ask, you know, who, who should we have on the Design and Purpose podcast? And, uh, someone nominated you. So it's been a little bit of a hunt for the Jaguar to get you, to get you in here. Sure. But thank you for accepting because it was, um, it was very short notice, but definitely wanted to get one in the shack before we moved out of here. And, um, Jag, if you could just, yeah, just, I, I've had a look through your profile. Like, I'm, it's actually so timely that you've come in here today. Mm-hmm. But uh, tell us a little bit about about you and, and what you do. So I'm still, you know, I've been doing this for five years. I call myself a therapist, mm-hmm. um, but I'm not of the traditional modalities, the schools of modality, right? Mm-hmm. I think when it comes to traditional therapy, and I may get some flack for this, and I can be pretty controversial around things, I just say it how it is um, based on how I strip back social agendas, constructs, identity constructs, all of that. So therapist is an approachable sort of cover-all term where it's like I work in the space to help people overcome trauma, which a lot of therapists do, and there's a lot of good therapists out there. But I always say to people, they say, you know, what degree do you have? And I'm like, well, I did a Bachelor of Integrative Psychotherapy, which I didn't complete because it wasn't adequate to what I wanted to achieve in the Mm -hmm. world. And I thought, you know, if... These modalities were that good, it would have healed the last generation and we wouldn't need it anymore. We would, there wouldn't be any mental health issues. But there's more mental health issues now than there's ever been. We're a sicker society than we've ever been. Mm. And so going down a traditional route wasn't going to be something that was going to achieve the results that I wanted to achieve for people. And I said to myself, I'm not going to do this unless I can be the, like one of the most effective in the world at helping people get rid of trauma or heal trauma and move through it. So I kind of had to find my own way. So I danced between the world of, you know, philosophy, physics, um, language, linguistics, the mind, the body, and I sort of have developed my own system around it. So that Mm. would probably be the most accurate description Mm. of what I could do. I'm more of a physicist than anything, but it's not relatable. If someone saw a physicist on my Instagram profile, you know, what the fuck is that? You know, whereas a therapist is probably the closest ancestor of what I'm doing, but it's not exactly that because therapies typically talk therapy. And I can talk about as well the the nature of that because our traditional talk therapy is much more feminine based because females operate on both sides of the brain. Men operate on one side. So we connect through movement and roughhousing and physicality. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we're sitting down talking like this, it's the feminine approach to healing, which is why therapy is not very effective for men. Because our brains are different. Yeah. So it's kind of bringing all this together to develop a mode or a model which is effective for anyone and helps men and is working for the individual but can be uh, broad, in a broad scope used for anyone as well. Mm. Um, and so that's, yeah, uh, th- that's probably what I do. Okay. Probably a good description. <laughs> in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a 15 minute nutshell. <laughs> No, it's good. It, it's, um, I've had a look at some of your stuff and, and it's, uh, it definitely resonates. You know, there's a lot in there around, you know, trauma and, and identity, you know, and how that's kind of all wrapped in, in together. Mm-hmm. And, and how did you, how did you find yourself in a place where you're doing this work? Cause you mentioned off, off ca- a camera that you were in, in finance or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I had an investment company for, eight, ten years or something like that. My nickname in Sydney was the Wolf of Wall Street guy. Oh, and not so jagging you up? Wasn't jagging Was that taken? <laughs> it wasn't ready to, it wasn't ready to emerge yet. Your wolf was taken. Yeah, yeah, the wolf was, it was wolf and then jagging so these sort of iterations okay. of identity around animals, right? And people used to call me wolf, right? That was the, mm-hmm. the nickname, but I'm like, yeah, I can't take that into the next the next space. And I'll talk about the Jaguar um, uh, nick, nickname or name, how it came through. But You know, I was selling investments and I was really good at it, you know, and I had an investment company flipping houses in the States. But in 26, 15, I think it was, I just couldn't do it anymore. I was like, I can't do this. You know, I was doing drugs all the time and 
sleeping around and, you know, I was the bachelor with the multi-million dollar apartment, the gold Rolexes, the Porsches, the all, just all that shit. But I was desperately miserable, like desperately, desperately miserable. And I had it all and I was traveling the world first class, friends all over the world, you know, high living, like or just the, just that burning the candle pretty hard. You know, I say yeah. about that life. It's like sitting in your driveway in your car with your foot on the accelerator while your handbrake's on and then expecting the engine to last forever. Mm. It's not going to, it's going to burn out pretty quick and malfunction. And so I remember I moved to New Zealand because I wanted to figure out what it was that I was supposed to do. And I had to exercise myself out of the environment that I was in. And I use, I think it was Hippocrates that said it, or maybe it was Plato or something, that you cannot heal in the same environment that made you sick, whether that's you know, a drug taking one, friendships, a intimate relationship, a business, you know, mm-hmm. anything like that, you can't heal in the same environment that made you sick. It doesn't work like that. So I was in an environment with, you know, very high flying, you know, toxic, I would say. I don't like the word toxic because I, I don't think that really there's, there's toxic, there's unhealthy behavior, but most of it's unconscious. So I'm not a fan of the word toxic, but it was toxic. Yeah. Um, around toxic men, real womanizers, you know, like all that sort of stuff. And I didn't want to be in it anymore. It was just my soul was going, dude, you've got to do something else. So I moved to New Zealand and I chose five subjects to explore. One was music, one was tattooing, uh, one was motorcycles, one was Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and the other was naturopathy. And I was over there doing a lot of drawing because my one of my closest friends is my tattoo artist. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, you know, I'm pretty much covered from my head side of my head's done all the way down to my feet, basically. And so I was sitting there one day and I woke up and I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to write some stuff out. No plan or anything like that. So what do I spend most of my time researching? And it was like, you know, shamanism, mystical experiences, consciousness, trauma, you know, uh, the personality, identity, all this Mm -hmm. stuff. I was like, okay. And then I said, well, what comes to me naturally, which was language and speaking. And that's something that is just all I've just always been really good at. And I said, well, what are my passions? And it was like, well, jiu-jitsu, I love closing deals. I loved selling at the time. You know, I love speaking. Like, it was all about speaking. Yeah. And then what do people come to me for? It was advice on business or relationships or, you know, just to be listened to. I looked at it. I was like, oh, I'm meant to be a therapist. And it was just that. It was that simple. Mm. Is that? Did you come up with that framework? Yeah. Yeah. It, was, so, it, I, it wasn't even a framework I came up with. It was just something that happened. Yeah, okay. And I was just writing it out. And I looked at it. I went, Oh, all right. I'm meant to be a therapist. So I moved back to Sydney and then started a Bachelor of Integrative Psychotherapy. And when I was doing that, during that time, there were some mystical experiences happening at the time. You could call it divine intervention. You could call it relationship with God or spirit. It doesn't matter Mm -hmm. what we label it. But I knew I was meant to work in sexual trauma, not because it's never happened to me, but I just knew I was meant to work in it. And I didn't quite know why. Um, I later found out that it happened to my dad at boarding school. And so I feel maybe there was a lineage for me to end mm. with that by healing that. And I remember I spoke to a professional about it and uh, she said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go into sexual trauma. And she laughed and she goes, well, good luck because it can't be healed and there's nowhere that teaches it. I said, oh, well, fuck you. I'll go and figure it out. Like, you know, and that's what I did. And so the first couple of years was exclusively working with women that had been sexually abused as a child. Would it be quite intense, I imagine? It was because I wasn't really prepared for it. Yeah. And I don't think you ever can be. But, you know, I've been involved in, like, you know, deep releases of trauma to what you could pretty much say would be exorcisms with what's going on. I won't go too far into it with that just out of because it's fucking intense. But, you know, I've worked with women that have been um, victims of satanic ritual abuse. Oh, wow, that's heavy stuff. Heavy stuff, yeah. So there's been some intense stuff oh, that I've seen. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. We had Dale on the pod here. I don't know if you know Dale. Like. No. Oh, yeah. He kind of talks a bit to some of that stuff. Yeah. Um, what, what was it like uh, being a man working with women in that space? Yeah, it was. Yeah, how were you it's received a good question. in that? Yeah, it's a good question. It was a real gift because these women had been brutalized by men. And so... I was able to adequately hold the space as a man for their safe journey into healing and then out of it. So I was given the gift of being able to hold the space safely for the woman so she could transmute that, mm. which was, which was, which was really good. 
It was good. But I made like a covenant with God before I started. And I said, if this is what I'm meant to do, I'll never, ever, ever cross the line with a client. And this happens a lot in the coaching world where they end up sleeping with the clients or there's a false love that can come through and transference mm-hmm. and counter transference and all this stuff where they can idealize you. And it happened a lot with me because I'd been this father figure, this, you know, man that's a safe place for them. And yeah. then this aspect of them falling in love with me, which happened a lot of times mm. over the fact that I'd helped them to transmute that. And so then the romance starts to be projected towards me. Yeah. But I just never crossed the line with that because I made a covenant around really. that. It's good to have some boundaries around that stuff. Huh? I think that's the only reason why life matched me up with that is because I was firm on it. I was like, yeah. no, I'll, I'll never do it. There's yeah. no way. And um, I won't lie and say that I wasn't tempted by it, but my conviction and discipline stood stood strong in the face of that. Yeah. So. And and how do you um, tie in the identity stuff with all that? So you've got the, the trauma piece there, and yeah. obviously trauma definitely impacts your identity. Yeah. But how did you find that flow and that connection between those two? So when I was in the investment world, what I would do is I could tell, I started to be able to listen very intently where I could hear what someone wasn't saying. Yeah. And this was, maybe this was a gift that was given to me, I don't know, but it's in what someone doesn't say, which is what I really pick up on, and I use that as the access point to be able to help someone. Mm. So I would be selling an investment to someone, and I'd know when they're lying, I would just know by the way that they breathe, you know, or the slight intonations in their, you know, the tightening of the esophagus when they're trying to say something because they're speaking from here because their heart rate's gone up and then their, yeah. their lungs are starting to constrict because they're about to lie to me because they're on the spot. And I remember I was, I was training someone in it and I heard a guy, he went silent, he goes, and I said to him, man, I go, he likes it. He goes, oh, I like this. And he's like, how do you know that? I'm like, breathing sort of gives it all away. And so what I started to see was there was this programming that each person was susceptible to. And I'm like, it's like I'm talking to automatons. And I sort of delineated about four different structures that people would live within. I'm like, this person doesn't trust. This person's got a fear of loss. This person's got a desire for gain. And this person's just um, a... Or was it like a socializer? So he's looking for social proof and waiting for someone to either tell him to do it or not to do it. And so I would be like, if I'm with the person that doesn't trust as a fear of loss, mm. they'll be like, oh, you know, like I haven't made many good returns over the last years and I just can't keep risking it, et cetera, et cetera. But then you get the greedy person that's the opposite. And so then I started to be able to say, these sentences are the same that are coming out of people. Yeah. And I did easy 10,000 hours doing that. And I, I got to the point, I, I, it would even be a joke, I'd be like, look, I know what you're going to say. You're going to tell me that your wife doesn't want to do it, and you know, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, ah, what? <laughs> like that, so I neutralized it straight away. But then I started to see programming. It was yeah. programming. That's what it was. And so I had no idea that this foundation was going to form the structure for what I do now. It was this... One was essentially fairly manipulative, like I was selling investments to people that needed it. They worked the investments until they didn't work, right? But now, like, that same structure in language works for people to help release stuff through their awareness. Yeah, I've seen you doing some of this stuff on your, on your Instagram. Like you're getting people to say stuff, right? Yeah. And then you're getting them to feel, feel into it. Yeah. Yeah, we had, um, we had Chrissy. I went and did some stuff with the mana. I don't know if you're the mana movement with Chrissy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I went to a few of their things and they kind of did something similar where they're looking for hooks and patterns and things and then you get to the bottom of it and then you can kind of remove it, right? Because you've got yeah. to feel it, the, the energy in motion. That's part of yeah. it, sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's part of it. So the structure I work with that everything in the world of physics is vibration. So vibration, what that manifests as is the word. Yeah. The word is before. If, you, if I'm looking at something like this and I don't have a name for it, I'm not going to be attached to it. It doesn't mean anything to me. It's yeah. like if you look at like a picture, you don't know what it is. It doesn't mean anything to you. So the vibration creates the word. Mm. It can be the other way too. If you give, if you put a name on something, it can take the meaning away. You know, like, it's like the thing named is not the name to thing. Yeah, it's yeah. only the meaning that I place on. It's like the map is the territory, but the territory is not the map. You know. Yeah. And so, it, a vibration creates the word. A word creates a language. 
language creates a code and code creates programs. So programs sit in the subconscious which form parts of our identity. These programs are switched on through traumatic events. And each one of these programs, there's fundamental ones, there's about 40 of them. What happens is when they switch on, certain thoughts are inside this container, this construct, this prison. So thoughts, what they do is they inform feelings. So thoughts are 20 times stronger from a frequency perspective from physics. Mm. So thoughts are scalar wave energy. So what they do is they go out, they hit the edge of their boundary, and then they ripple back in. And they keep going like this, like a toroidal field, right? Yeah, yeah. So thoughts inform feelings. Now, people challenge me on that a lot because it's all about feeling now in our society. And when we look at, look at it, when I, we talk about heartbreak is a good example. You're not thinking about the person. You're not upset. You're not walking down the street going, oh, what's, what's all this sadness coming on? No, it's going to be, I miss this person. I'm sad because we've mm. broken up. And then that's going to start to generate the feeling. So it's not the other way around. It doesn't, unless it's a trigger, but even that is still going to sit because the trigger is going to activate the subconscious program. Yeah. Now, thoughts inform feelings. Feelings will drive behavior. Behavior dictates results and results create experiences of life. Experiences that repeat from an automated set of software is going to start to form a pattern. And then that's going to keep collapsing into form yeah. and it being attracted in. So when I say collapsing into form, when they were doing the double slit experiment in physics, they were firing photons down a tube. And when they were observing it, it appeared as a photon. And when they weren't observing it, it would uncollapse into a wave, which is pure potential. And so the wave function matches with the frequency, goes through fourth dimensional time and collapses into three dimensional particle. And this is how we operate with these programs, which is the frequency attaching to the fifth wave function, fifth dimensional wave function. And then the same circumstances just keep collapsing in because it's unconscious. Once we're aware of it, it uncollapses and then the frequency goes back in for someone else to pick up on. Okay. So when, just to clarify that, you're saying when the scientists weren't looking at it, it would it exist went, as it a went, wave. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I um, actually heard something quite profound just kind of on this topic the other day. Was it, I went to this like, party out, out near here somewhere and there was this kind of wizard-looking guy and we ended up chatting for like three hours and he was talking about experience. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about your your awareness impacts your perception, impacts your perspective, which impacts your experience. Yeah. So it's like, is what you're suggesting through your awareness of your thoughts, you can change your experience? So it's a good question, right? So awareness of the thoughts are not going to change it. It's aware, awareness of the prison or the program that houses the thoughts. Okay. So like one of the... Um, Let's say it's like, I'm not enough, right? That's one of them, which I never work in because everyone knows it. So I'm not enough is not going to show up as, oh, I'm not enough. Not many people actually say, well, I'm not enough. They're like, well, I'm not pretty enough. I'm not tall yeah. enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm too old. I'm too young. That's how that's going to manifest. But if we look at another one, which is I'm not safe. This is a very deep one. I'm not safe. Yeah. So I'm not safe. What that's going to do is going to sit in the space of presence, right? So right now, I'm not safe. That's how I'm going to feel. And so then what is going to happen, these thoughts are going to come up, which are around relative to some sort of danger, threat, or loss that is going to be incurred through this program being active. It might be a father that was abusive or alcoholic or a mother that was narcissistic and would rage or a divorce that happened. And so when the child experiences like a divorce and the father leaves or the mother leaves, they're going to have a sense of separation where they don't feel safe because their needs aren't going to be met. And then they recreate that in a partnership when they get older. Mm -hmm. And then when the person threatens a breakup or leaves, then that's going to activate the I'm not safe thing. So they're going to try to do everything to counter the I'm not safe by controlling everything around them so they know everything. So the thoughts are going to come up, haven't heard from my partner for three hours, he's cheating, he's going to leave me, I know he's met someone else and he's having a nap. And so the feelings are going to be anxiety, fear, Mm -hmm. threat, response, concern, worry. The behavior is going to be, well, I'm going to go to his house and see if he's there, right? Or I'm going to contact his friends. I'm going to ring him 40 times. Yeah. And then the results are going to be the partner's going to be like, fuck, this is too much for me. Like, relax. And then they're going to leave. leave. So it's going to be self-generating and reinforce the very thing that they're trying to avoid. Yeah. So that's one sort of programming, the manifestation of how it works. Okay. Do you think that's a lot of the time these programs show up in the partners that we choose? In the opposite way. So they have every, there's a dynamic and there's a passive state to it. So the dynamic, which is I'm not safe in a relationship is going to be anxious attachment. 
the passive is going to be avoidant attachment. So I'm going to attract in someone that's going to potentially leave me and be avoidant because I want to move towards them and they're going to move away so I can heal that part yeah. of myself. Does that make sense? Yep, yep, I gotcha. So they'll be the same program but of the opposite arm. Yeah, there's like polarities to all these these um, yeah. programs, right? Yeah. Yeah, I just did some work on this. I, did this. Like, I don't know if you've heard of Universal Rays before, but I just did this and this. You can be in the higher aspect of that part of your character or yeah. you you know you can be in the lower aspect and, it, and they both impact you in different ways and they create different feelings you know yeah. um like confidence and arrogance you yeah. know is the lower polarity yeah um interesting so when we talk about um relationships and we're talking about relating which is a whole you know a whole other thing <laughs> on its own um i saw something you were posting around like trauma based rela- r- relationship or, or abusive relationships yeah there was one piece around that um and why we do that which you kind of touched on there mm-hmm. uh and trauma bonding which i think it's a, it's a term that kind of gets throws around thrown around a lot too same with narcissism same with narcissism yeah. so could you talk a little bit to the to the trauma bonding piece so trauma bonding, when I was looking at this, because it's like, you know, we have the twin flame thing as well, yeah. right? The twin soul, twin flame, runner and chaser. It's like, no, that's anxious and avoidant attachment for starters. So the twin flame thing is a romanticized idea of a, I don't consider those trauma bonds. Trauma bonds happen in the relationship, not because you've met someone. Mm-hmm. So there is an aspect where you're bonding over trauma, but what happens is the reason why there's an activation point that's very intense is because you become, you start to anticipate your childhood needs being met because this person has the same vibrational signature or frequency that one of your caregivers did that you've got unfinished business with. So that's the first thing. So it's like, oh my God, all this stuff is going on and there's all this intoxication that's going on because what that feels like is to experience wholeness in the absence of childhood wounding. Mm. So this person's, oh, my God, this is like my mom or this is like my dad or, you know, oh, my God, I feel like finally I'm going to get my needs met. And for the first three, six months, it's all wonderful. It's great. It's connecting and all that. And then after that, then we move into a different stage of it, which is like a power struggle stage or a conflict stage. Mm. And it's like, you're not the person that I met six months ago. Who are you? And that's where the work starts to happen. Relationships are for healing and not to get love. Love is the byproduct of the healing experience. So most people are like, I'm in deficit. You're responsible for the deficit. You need to fill my deficit, but it's not. So as an example, and I'll get into my definition of the trauma bond in a sec. As an example, like the anxious person, the anxious person brings someone in and then they believe that that person is the source of the connection they're experiencing. So when they're away from them, they're miserable. And when they're closer, then they feel whole again. But they've attracted that person in not to make that person responsible for the connection. They they bought them in to reveal the disconnection from themselves. Mm -hmm. That's why it's like they're gone, they're not there, they're there, they're okay. So a trauma bond is usually what will happen when a child's ego boundaries get dissolved by a parent. Now, what that means is a child can only experience the world through their nervous system up until about seven, some people say 12, but we'll say seven. So the child, when they're made responsible for the parent's feelings, right, this is super important for people to understand. When a child makes the, when a parent makes the child responsible for the parent's feelings, so like a a cell, right, you know, like they're shaped like donuts, like Mm -hmm. in the body, like the cell wall is to keep out the bad and keep in the good. When a child gets traumatized by the parent, holes get punctured in the cell wall. This is healthy boundaries. What happens is the parent starts to engage in making the child responsible for their feelings. So what the child starts to think is, oh, I'm the one that's been yelled at. I'm the one that's yelling and I'm the house that contains it all. What happens is the parent then breaks the heart of the child, an abusive parent will break the heart of the child, rob the innocence and then engage in what's called mortification. This is like a narcissistic parent Mm -hmm. where they kill the programming and the voice of the child and install it with the parents one. And this is where a trauma one happens. This is so interesting because I, I like, you know, being, being gay and like I I noticed some dialogues in my, in my own 
programming, you know, like even like homophobic almost like sometimes in my own dialogue, I had to really kind of like go through a lot of process around that myself. So yeah, I definitely have experienced some, some aspects of that yeah. in my, in my own healing. So trauma yeah. bonding, most people, it's just another like viral term that's gone out there, but that's how a, a, an abusive or narcissistic toxic parent will trauma bond the child because they want the child to be the extension of them. That's the thing. So if they make them the extension of them, they're easier to control. So then the child fed P for kids with narcissistic parents. One of the programs that they're going to start that's going to activate is I don't exist. And so their sense of self will be destroyed. It will be put down. It will be broken. It will mm. be doubted. They'll be gaslit. They'll be what well, then what will happen is a parent as they get older and people do this in relationships. So even if you didn't have that as a child, there's a method which abusive people use in relationships to trauma bond you, which is idealize, devalue, discard, and then hoover. So they build you up. They slowly start to build to break you down. They get rid of you and then they pull you back in. And this forms a trauma bond in an adult relationship. Because what happens is the peaks and the troughs. So let's say the troughs mm. are, you know, where you're nice and calm and everything's good and there's connection and there's co-regulation. Yeah. And then the peaks are the instability and the fights and the conflict. Yeah. So what happens is over time when you're being idealized, devalued, discarded, who that, and I've been in a relationship like that and it gives you PTSD. And so what happens is your troughs, your peaks, sorry, become your next level of troughs. So your high state of anxiety mm. and concern and worry then start to turn into your next baseline for relaxing and then they take you to another level until you see it for what it is and that's where you exit the relationship. You have to, otherwise you end up with severe PTSD. Yeah. And they're probably super hard to leave as well, right? Because you probably get addicted to this. Yeah. Highs and lows, all the, the chaos in it. That's intermittent reinforcement. Yeah. And so it's a, be it's a little bit of love and sex in the container of validation and, um, yeah. it, like, sorry, discarding and dismissing and disrespect so it's love in the container of abuse it's acknowledgement in the container of disrespect is attention in the container of dismissiveness yeah and it can and especially because these people often they develop a very very sweet disposition on the surface so they'll be very kind very charming very gentle very loving very cognitively empathic but then behind closed doors they're fucking ruthless and yeah. they, they will, all they want to do is break you. That's that they get off on breaking yeah. you. Yeah. And where does that come from? Like, like, what kind of develops somebody with those characteristics? Traumatic upbringing. Yeah. It's a coping mechanism to, um, it's quite CPTSD, which creates that. So, which is complex PTSD. Okay. So, PTSD is like a single shot. So, it's like if you get someone that's been in a war zone, explosion goes off, they hear a backfire in a car, yeah. they start to go into that. Yeah. Then you've got complex PTSD where you can't really say where it was from or when it was formed. And this happens when it's the nature of continual abuse from someone. And so narcissism and borderline bipolar, you know, malignant borderline, malignant narcissism, they're all responses to complex PTSD. Mm. So the person's sense of self is so fragile that they have to develop something external to them. And this is how they manage and see the world because if they get too close to the wound, it's too painful for them. It's quite sad. You know, I've been in a relationship yeah. like that and I ended up with PTSD from it, which I had to work through. But yeah. it was a real gift because I then got to help other people through it too. Yeah. So. Is there any hope for doing healing work with a narcissist in Look, relationship? Uh, well, are, are they just like so – are they unaware that they're doing it? Yeah, they can't. They can't really be self-referential. So you can have like narcissism with a small N and narcissism with a capital N. Yeah. The narcissist with a capital N, no, I don't think so. Because you can't get through to them to make them think there's something wrong with them because their defense mechanisms are so good. It's like being in a house of mirrors. You know, it's like every single thing they will won't they they it's them everywhere, but you can't ident they can't identify the real self. They don't know, they don't have a um, they struggle with what's called object constancy. So the object constancy is like the, the source of their safety and love isn't constant. And so they don't know. And that's what happens to them internally. And so it's like being in a house of mirrors, you don't know which one's the original reflection. So if we walked in and you were trying to look for me, you wouldn't know which one's the real me. And that's them. Mm. 
So they don't have this internal locus of stability for them to be able to go there. And if you do and you do get close, they'll gaslight you, they'll manipulate you, they will defend it, they'll do anything to get away from the fact that they've done something wrong. Yeah. So it's yeah, very hard. I think I know this one quite well. Yeah, I unfortunately do too. Fortunately, but unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. And what what do you think about this idea? Like, do you know Gillian Tarecki? Do you listen to her stuff? Yeah, someone, a friend of mine, she sent me a podcast on her a couple months ago on she, chemistry. She was sort of, I love her stuff. She's she's cool. She puts yeah, she's got that podcast, Gillian, on, on love. But she talks a lot about relationships and trauma bonding and. And all this stuff. And, and she talks about, um, she talks about healthy relationships feel kind of boring. Uh, yeah. Is that, is that your take on it? I agree. Yeah. I think there's, I think, you know, I sort of delineate these four main tenets in a relationship that you should have. So it's like a chair, right? So one is communication. The other one is there's got to be a tight friendship as well in it. Not necessarily best friends because that can become too, you know, a bit too incestuous if it goes that way. There needs to be sexual community, sexual connection and there needs to be respect and admiration. Respect is for the man, admiration, love for the woman. If you have all four of those, you'll have a good relationship. And one thing that I want everyone to really get, relationships are going to have conflict. Conflict is normal. And there's nothing wrong with it. Mm. It's fucking normal. But some people, especially people that are malignant, borderline, or narcissistic, will expect no conflict, yet they'll be the generators of conflict. Yeah. You know? And so you a boring one, I would say, is one thing, but the absence of a lot of intensity is probably a better way to describe it because boring is like... Why, why would you want to be in a boring relationship? No, I don't want to be in a boring no, I want to be in one that's, that's interesting, that's fulfilling, that's rewarding, that's intimate. I don't want to be in one that seems like, you know, I'm just hanging out with a woman that's like, yeah, okay, like cool. grandma. Yeah, you know <laughs> what I mean? So, but I get what she's saying. She'd be saying it in a, in a thing like where it should feel stable and calm. Yeah, I think your nervous easy. system, you know, you're not like going through those peaks and troughs that you're talking about there. Yeah. You're like, you know, you're feeling calm and... Yeah. Kind of neutralized. Or. Yeah, it should be a, a sense of stability and a sense of safety in cars, yes. which is better than boredom. Yeah, that's what she's saying. She goes, before you have physical intimacy, make sure you have security and safety. Yeah. Or ma- before you have the, um, before you agree to even be in a relationship with them, make sure there's safety and security. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Especially as a man, we're really responsible for that. You know, where I know a lot of men and what, what we want is just peace. You know, like I, in my previous partnerships, like I could be working and I just want my woman sitting next to me, not necessarily talking, not going through anything, but just her presence next to me is nice, right? So peace. Peace is a big thing for me. Does she bring peace or does she bring chaos? Mm. Now, if there's chaos, I'm like, no, I'm not interested. Yeah. And because yeah. like there's the whole feminine chaos and in the polarity teachings, it's like, Oh, you should just be able to test him a thousand times and a thousand times more. And that was something I actually saw on a polarity teaching thing by a woman. And I was like, test me a thousand times and a thousand times more. I'm like, that's once a day for six years. I said, if you tested me once a, once a day for six days, I'd be fucking like, get out of here. I don't have time to deal with this. Okay. You definitely work in finance. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, fuck, but that, that's what that is, is that's abuse at that point. That's a poor example. Yeah. And obviously six days, no. But if someone was testing me every day for six weeks, I'd be like, this is chaos. Mm. You know, there's got to be a sense of maturity and um, consideration for the other person that we bring in. So security and safety, and when I run men, run with men through this, you got to learn to make a living first because if you can't make a living and commit to yourself, you cannot look after anyone else. And there's a lot of fucking mummies, boys out there and boys masquerading as men that don't have their shit together. They really don't. And, you know, for the guys out there that are listening to this, there's nothing attractive about being 35, 40, living at home with your parents, wandering your mum over your woman, not being able to make a living and playing fucking video games. There's nothing attractive about that. Mm. So get your security first. That's your provision and your protection. That's physical. Safety after that is emotional. And you won't be able to get, you might be able to get to the emotional state, but without the others, you're probably going to be overly feminine and then be seeking to be her, for her to be your mother. So you want a man that's secure, 
and like you know physical financial they're the first two and then emotional comes with that well you get all of those three right you sort it mm. but i think a man needs to have security physical and financial first because otherwise it'll just be like i'll be my mum, you know yeah or your girlfriend one of those yeah and there's probably a lot of that going on heaps yeah heaps yeah um why do you think that that has happened to society? Why do you think that we have all these man childs getting around the place? Feminism. Okay, feminism. feminism. Yeah, feminism. So people think when I say feminism is a problem that I'm some misogynist, right? But I'm all for equal rights. Like, it's not about that. And it never was about that. Mm. You know, firstly, like, feminism didn't start in the 60s. It started in 1923 in the Frankfurt School with very clear outcomes firstly it's an arm of communism it's marxist influence secondly it's like in the western world now there's n almost no place where women have different rights to men so that argument's kind of gone out the window it's finished right we talk about the pay gap the pay gap that's largely an illusion because men have been it's statistical evidence that men work longer and they do harder jobs which pay more so i was having a conversation with a mate the other day and if we, if you look at, um, Scandinavia as an example, and this will all wrap up, right? Cause I've got to provide context. If you look in Scan Scandinavia, which is Scandinavia, which is an egalitarian society, men took on jobs that are more delineated or suitable for men, and women did ones that are more suitable for women, right? And that's just our natural stuff playing out. But what's happened is because in 1923, they said, we want to make men the oppressors and women the oppressed. So they start the campaign towards that. Why? To split the family up. You split the family up. The woman goes into the workforce. It creates division between women and men. Guess who gets to raise the children? The state. And, the, te much and the television. And the television, right? So both parents are working. Children are largely absent. What happens is marriage breaks down. Connection to God starts to fade out. And their other um, initiative was to install homosexuals in the church to destroy it. That was the whole thing and create pedophiles and things like that. That was their mission. And most people don't know that. Now, in feminism, there was one of the matriarchs was Simone de Beauvoir, whose partner was John, Jean Paul Sartre. They, she used to groom girls to be raped by him. She was one of the founding members of in the feminist arm back in the day. She's French. She called fetuses parasites. Um, and what happened is because women went to the workforce, they started to develop this strong, independent woman that don't need no man thing. So what's happened is there's been this switch energetically of women that have gone out to be boss babes, leaving the men kind of, well, I don't know what to do. I don't have a use. So they don't get to develop into men because it's gone the other way. So then now it's like feminism. If we look at the um and this was quite funny because i was i was teaching this in my masculinity course the other day and the traits to and i'll just rattle them off i can't remember exactly if i said to you who do you think these traits are for right so nurturing very feeling validate others feelings and their emotional experience not using bad language never control or be aggressive towards anyone um be nurturing seek female mentors um and go into talk therapy with females i would say who would you say that that's aimed at well it's aimed at guys right? yeah it is aimed at guys but those are the tenets of healthy masculinity that they're saying in the american psychological association okay those are feminine traits Okay. All of those are feminine traits. Yeah. But, they're, they're, like, I heard you talking about the, the twin flame before, you know. It's like um, we had we had um, Joe Rushton on the podcast here um, a few episodes back, and she was talking about this thing. The twin flame is actually the two aspects of yourself. Mm. It's not outside you. It's your own balance of your masculine and feminine. So it's like, you know, within within men, do you, you, you know, and women probably too, there is those energies, right, like the, the yin and yang energies that you can kind of put through mm -hmm. um i don't know where i was going with that but do you do you see it like that do you see no. do you see you don't see it like that you no. reckon it's like men have the it's all yang no yin correct you can take on traits yeah okay, okay. that are feminine or masculine which is okay that's the way you want to live your life like that's okay right i just look for evidence in things okay and so i've worked with tons of women and men now that what I believe we're here to do, and this is through my own experience, is girl psychology, boy psychology, 
transcend that into woman psychology and man psychology, they're never going to want to go and try and find their masculine if they're a woman or feminine if they're a man. Once you transcend childhood stuff, it just doesn't happen. So what happens is as we start to transcend our childhood psychology, a maturity comes in and then a settling comes in. And I've never met, I've worked with hundreds of men now, thousands of women. When I take them out of the girl psychology, not one of them has ever come back and said, I need to go and embrace all my masculine and start to compete with men. If they were before, they go old, they go back to the feminine. They want to be a, a wife, a mother and embrace that nurturing mm-hmm. aspect, which they didn't have. So this thing is like the way that I see it. And, you know, it's big out there because if we look in into history, Every one of the demonic, evil deities was both masculine and feminine internally. That's the thing. All of them. Give me, give me one of them. Oh. Wow. Oh. Yeah, Moloch. Moloch. Like oh, Moloch, like the, goat, the goat thing. The goat-headed one, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. He has both male and female characteristics. So okay. we're looking at this, like we're looking at what's going on in the world at the moment. There's a lot of, of that worship going on. And so, well, you're talking about like trance. You, you're talking about the trance. Not like, necessarily that. Stuff or what? Well, not necessarily that because that's kind of like that's new. But this other yeah. stuff has been around for a while. Yeah. Okay. Right. So that that might be an influence of that. Yeah. Right. Like, and again, so I don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with, you know, anyone that's an adult that's making their decisions. Yeah. Make your decisions. Like, yeah. I don't care. So that's the first thing. And the second thing in it is like if we go back and look at different societies, they collapse when the gender thing starts to come in. That's proven in history. Yeah, well, I guess, it, yeah, well, actually, funny you say that because um, when I, we went, I went to this exhibition out in Sydney. It was, it was about, it was, um, um, <coughs> what's it called? Um, the Barangaroo. You know the, the headland there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think Barangaroo, well, I know Barangaroo was named after a, a female. Indigenous person from that area. Yeah, okay, I didn't know. And uh, that happened. The women were the fisher f- fisher women, like they were the ones that went and caught the fish. Yeah, it was the women's job. They used to wear their like hooks around their their neck. You know, it was like jewelry and things like that. And they'd be out on these little wooden um, boats with their babies and fishing, and you know, amazing. That's awesome. But um, when the when the um, colonists came in, they just got nets out and they just started catching all these fish. Mm-hmm. So it just completely destroyed the the female role in society because yeah. they were the providers of the food. So, mm-hmm. you know, that was, you know, definitely t- speaks to what you're saying there. Yeah. And it's an identity piece too, really, isn't it? Like Massively, we, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all identity. So because of that, you know, like I'm reading um, John Wineland's book at the moment from the core, which is a masculine one. Okay. And I'm like, I'm not a fan. And I, I like his stuff. He's done a lot of good stuff. I've used his breathwork practices. A lot of his teaching has been really good. But, you know, he go, he's very woke in his approach to it, which is that balancing that inner masculine, inner, inner feminine, right? And I look at it, and I was of that volition too for a while. And I, I went down that path, and I researched, and I looked at it, and I stripped it apart. And I'm like, this doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It just doesn't make sense, and I haven't found the evidence for it yet either. Like, I'm all for evidence, and some people will say, you know, um, chromosomes, like XXXY is an example. Um, So XY is the male, XX is the female, but the female is produced in the absence of a Y, not because of the X. So that's fairly conclusive. Um, And it's and that's still like, you know, if we're looking at it from that point, you know, just because one of the genders has more of one hormone it doesn't necessarily mean that's the female hormone you know it's like we've got to look at this point from the energetic aspect that we're talking about versus the biological aspect of it so it's like the biology is fairly conclusive in the way that it presents Mm -hmm. so i'm not talking about biology i'm talking about this this um integration aspect and a lot of people get triggered online by me saying this because i'm like i'm a man right i'm a very masculine man and i know because when i was seeking for answers it was almost like I was like a child looking for an answer to give to me so I found some place in the world. But once I started to overcome my own trauma from growing up, there was no part of me that, you know, wanted to 
embrace my feminine. It didn't make sense to me. And it's not, and my woman would be my feminine counterpart. Otherwise, what use is she? Yeah. Why do we, why do we merge with our counterpart? And this could be energetic. Yeah. You know, like it could be, you know, if you're more masculine uh, based or feminine based, it's not to say that these traits can't exist in the other person mm -hmm. and how it's expressed in behavior. That's fine. But what is the point of having man and woman join together if I'm just going to enjoy going to join myself, which goes back to these ancient historical things around the demonic entities, which had both internally. Okay. It's interesting. It's kind of like how people get quite triggered by Andrew Tate, right? Like, yeah. like he, he's quite polarizing. I, I've got views on him. Like I, I, I don't like all the stuff that he says, you know, but yeah. I, I, I do see value in somebody like that yeah. bubbling up to the surface. It's like you have to ha – the, the society that we're creating is going to create resistance in, in, in that form and people are going to speak up and and those those opinions are going to come to the surface. And, yeah. and, I, and I, yeah, probably, you know, I do I do agree with, with a lot of the stuff that he talks about. And some other things I'm kind of a bit like – same. Yeah. yeah. I, I, mean, I take I take it as an input. Yeah. It's another perspective. It's interesting. It's – the thing is, it's like anything he's talking about is nothing new. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, get strong, you know, get moving as a man. Like, he's not some groundbreaking dude. I don't see him as a good influence because of his – that's prostitution all? network oh, yeah, and stuff. Yeah. No, I mean, like, I make a lot of money. Like, I like nice things. So I'm okay with that. You know, I smoke cigars. I smoke the same cigars as him, actually. Yeah, we should have brought me one. Yeah, I'm, yeah, actually, that would have been good to have a cigar here. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> like, I like, you know, expensive cars. I like expensive watches. And that's not just because he's doing it. I was into that a long time before that. I, those are the things that I enjoy, and they're a byproduct of my success. I do think a man should strive for success, 100%. I do think that you need strong brothers around you. I've got those around me. What I don't agree with is, is that his, his exploitation of women in the past, because if someone's going to be willing to do that, that shows a seriously corruptible moral aspect to him, one that is very difficult to then somehow transcend within a couple of years. And he hasn't apologized for it either. He hasn't mm -hmm. said, you know, I really regret it. He goes, no, that's how I was at the time. And it was only a few years ago. Like, being a pimp is a fucking big deal. And I don't respect that in him at all, in any sense. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's a corrupt uncle character, a very corrupt character flaw in him. And I would say if he wasn't famous, he'd probably still be doing it. Mm -hmm. So, but all the other stuff, you know, you look at a couple of the men that have been influencers, like Dan Bilzerian, and Andrew Tate, they're the fucking Kardashians for men. You know, they're not se they're not really serious. Yeah. But it's the thing that does concern me, it's like it's like what you're saying there. It's like people, you know, guys looking for answers, which yeah. they're going to do because it's been suppressed in society about masculinity, mm -hmm. um, are gonna look for answers and they're gonna see the loud voices like these guys. Yeah. And that's that's you know, that's exactly what I don't like about yeah. about that is that he's not a great ro role model no, and then it becomes and then it goes the extreme you know and then then you start you know it worries me about how these guys are then going to start treating women because these are the role models that they're 100%. getting their answers from that which they're probably very relieved to hear yeah it's okay to be masculine it's okay to have these traits masculine traits yeah and um and it's coming from somebody like that so yeah. i agree and yeah. so one thing just to i want to just go back to what you mentioned before about uh you know boys what happens is in our society now because of feminism it's split the family up and mothers 80 to 90 percent of the time get custody and so our boys are being raised by women is that true though because i yes. i i i feel, heard that um john howard changed the laws back in the day and it's actually that the men get favored in custody well, that's not based on statistics. And I looked at the statistics in Australia like two yeah. weeks ago and it's 80 to 90% of women get the custody. It doesn't mean that men don't have rights or access to the kids, but what I read online was 80 to 90% mm -hmm. of them get custody. It's like, uh, teachers. I think 50 to 70% of females are teachers and 85% of new therapists are female as well. So if we're looking at who's taking care of our boys, it's mainly women. It's more than 80% in total. Mm. So when we look at that, if a boy is raised by a woman majority, for the majority, he's going to become effeminate. That's not a diss on women either, by the way. By the, way. But the determining factor in a child's health 
is if the father is around and a decent role model. That's the determining. It's not a yeah. determining factor. But the the father could be a, a mummy's boy too, couldn't he? Uh, yeah, and <laughs> the previous relationship I was in, he was exactly like that with my ex. Okay. He was exactly like that. He was a mummy's boy. He was pathetic. I hope he watches this because he's pathetic. You know, it's pathetic. You know, yeah, it's right. like, it's just, no, you should not, like, it's not our job for, it's not a woman's job to mother us. Yeah. Like, grow the fuck up. Like, you know, not to be Andrew Tate about it, but fucking reclaim your balls. Yeah. Do some hard shit. Don't cry about it when things get difficult. Yeah, and I, and just, I, you know, women don't want a mother guys either. Some of them do. Do they? Because it gives them a purpose. Gosh, because, you know, like, I won't, I won't go t- too into it, but, you know, um, you know, just even in friendships and things like that, you know, it's just yeah. kind of, especially, like, I'm, you know, I'm quite, I'm quite strong in myself, so I find, you know, sometimes you just, it's frustrating, it's frustrating. Yeah. So yeah. The, the counter to that is the man becomes the rescuer, which was yeah. me for a long time. So I'm not going to sit here and just diss on one side like women mothering our boys too much, mm. but men also become rescuers because then that's still seeking the validation from the mother that they didn't get, which I played that archetype. Like, give me a woman in distress, fucking a white knight. Yeah, this is a karmic. This is karmic. I've been studying this a little bit. This um, you're talking about there, the rescuer. There's the perpetrator. There's the the warrior and the um the victim archetypes here, yeah. here right? Um. This studying this course at the moment called Path of Light with with Joe Rushton and, and Ishtar, and uh, that they call that the karmic wheel, and saying when you're making decisions based on those archetypes and you're in one of those archetypes, you're on the karmic wheel. Yeah. So you're not making decisions in your soul's highest. No. You're you yeah. But it's also is because you have to reveal that part of you in order to overcome it. Yeah. So okay. it kind of is going to be on your soul. It's it's not going to be your soul's highest expression of what's available. But it's for the lesson. It is, yeah. But but I I like to think about that in situations like, you know, like where am I making this decision from? Am yeah. I trying to? Am I feeling sorry, self pity for myself? Am I trying to? you know, rescue somebody because it's going to make me feel good or yeah. wanted or whatever. It's like, so I think with that awareness piece, it's like changing the experience by making sure you're not making a decision based on the comic wheel. So that's a good point. And it kind of goes back to what you said earlier, like the awareness informs your perception, which inf- informs your experience, right? But which perceptions, perspective, experience. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, perspective yeah, yeah. and perception are kind of similar word. So... Awareness, right, and your perspective is informed by your perception, but your awareness, if it's a blind spot, you don't have the awareness of that awareness. Well, that's right, because you don't know what you don't know. Exactly, yeah. and that's Until you learn the lesson, and then you go, I'll never do that again, and then you do it again. (laughs) And then you do it again. You're like, oh, I'll just see what happens here. You know, Maybe this will be different. It's like your red flags turn to pink flags, you know, and it's like that's where you've got to start to look at it. So it's, yeah, the man has the rescue archetype, and the rescue archetype will bring in the damsel in distress. Yeah, well, I've done this too, like, in relationship. I've been in situations where I do the rescuer thing. Yeah, same. Friendships, partnerships, and it doesn't end well for you because then you get your over-functioning. Yeah. And then you end up doing everything and yeah. not really creating sp- – like, then you're expected to do everything, and then when you go, whoa, whoa, it's too much, I can't actually do all of this anymore. Yeah. And the, then – then this is the identity piece you I saw on your on your feed today when I was looking at your profile, but that all starts to fall away. Yeah, because that relationship's been built on that system of rescue and yeah. damsel in distress. Yeah, it's not about it's not an authentic relationship because the rescuer is trying to get something. So the rescue is actually manipulative and it's under now manipulation is you know it's a charged term. Right, but it's like what we're really after is I just want this person to love me. I want them to see my value. That's really it. Yeah. And then when we have the mothers, the mothers go, "Cool. If I mother this boy, it's going to heal my father wound because I'll turn him into the man I need my father to be, needed my father to be." And that's why that construct plays out as well. It's all like it's all quite innocent, really. It's, it's, it's very programming, childish. right? It's a programming. Yeah. It's like until you, um, and Paul Check talks about this too. It's like 
the the you know most people are children. Yeah. Then you get to the warrior archetype where you start to like take care of your shit. Yeah. And you start to like you know get things organized and 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 maybe talking about financial security. Then you become the um, king and queen. Yeah. And then it's the wise man and wise woman. Sure. But most people don't leave that childhood archetype. So you have like a lot of people in adult relationships that are probably even well into their, you know, late stages of their life. Six, but, eight, but their emotional maturity is still a child archetype. Yep. And Definitely. then you have like, you know, we have these systems where you have governments and things like that that kind of like are like the parents to the childs in this society. Raised by the state. Yeah, being told what to do. Yeah, and also, like, we look at the previous generations, you know, my parents are post-World War II. Um, my dad was born during World War II. What World War II are you from? Country-wise? Yeah. I don't know. You don't know? No, I don't know. Like, there's some, I won't say it on there, I'll tell you about it afterwards, but few things have come around around my origin, which has been questionable. Oh, yeah. go what, on social media, the trolls? No, no, no. Oh, okay. no just oh you mean like, history, oh, yeah, oh, history, yeah. the milkman or something. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> like, I wrote it to my brother. Yeah, Very masculine like, milkman. Yeah, yeah. It so wasn't soy milk. An Italian one, you know, probably like, yeah, I don't know. There's been some stuff around that, which <laughs> it's okay. But I'm yeah, I'm really solid with my mum now after my father died. Okay. And so, yeah, like, she's great. Like, she's frozen in time, though, like my dad was. You mm. know, both suffers of severe trauma. My mum had a, a had a head injury when she was younger. Like, she was in one of, on one of those old trains, and her hair got caught in the wheel, and she got scalped. What? So she had traumatic brain injury. Yeah. No way. It's hectic, yeah. So all the front part of her <gasps> head came off, which is where the prefrontal cortex is, which is responsible for oh, empathising. Oh. Yeah, so even her friends that have known her, she's in her 70s now, like, yeah, she's never the same. You know, she's never the same. And then my dad went to Stanislaus School in Bathurst, which is known for its pedophilia. And I asked him one day, I said, you know, is there any sexual trauma in our family? He goes, yeah, you know, the brothers used to touch me when I was there at school. And it was known as being fucking ruthless. And so those things happen, you know. There's not a lot you can come back from in those generations. Oof. Very difficult. They don't have this, the same tools that we have now, do they? No, not the same awareness. Mm. They didn't have the same tools, capabilities, especially as men. It wasn't, you know, a man that's been sexually abused. That's a very painful experience. You don't talk about it, probably. No. It's like a lot of shame around it, probably. And My dad had, like, prostate cancer. Oh, he had, wow. like, heart conditions. He had three, four bouts of cancer. Tough as fuck. Lived till 85. Durable as... You know, very Aurelius type stoic, you know, I got a lot of that from him. But yeah, just dude was trapped in time, you know, yeah. so that's where we stay as children. And if we would challenge them, me or my siblings or stuff, they'd revert back to being like children. And I've been in relationships like that where if I challenge someone, they go into child mode. Yeah, they go back to the time of the trauma, right? Yeah. And you're not talking to the to this age person, you're talking to the, to the child the self. Yeah. yeah. You're talking to a little girl that, whose father left her. Yeah. You know, or the little boy whose mother hated him, you know, or left, got left behind yeah. somewhere. So that's where I see it. It's kind of like there's an innocence to it, but that can also land you in trouble because you can become way too tolerant, which is that was another fucking thing I had to work through as well, where it's because I'm a therapist, it's like I can understand this, I can, you know, work through this, I can fix this, I can change this, I can help this. And then it's um, you start tolerating tolerance. And that's where you start to get into like the PTSD realms and self-sacrifice and the archetype of the saint, which is like I can perform miracles, but at the full expense of my own self, you mm. know, which is that's an unhealthy adaptation as well. Yeah. Sorry. Interesting. Yeah. On the magician card, it's like there's a difference between magic and sorcery. Yeah. It's, it's like the, white magic and black magic, right? Well, it's like um, magic is to facilitate transformation in divine will yeah which is a capital w mm -hmm. but sorcery is to facilitate transformation in in the ego will mm -hmm. which is lower w yeah so it's you know it's the polarity again that we're talking about yeah interesting i've never heard that yeah. before so it's yeah. a good i've been getting into the tarot you yeah. get into the tarot no i don't fuck with that stuff anymore <laughs> Okay. I used to. I used to do the medicines in the tarot and all uh, that. 
and I worked with a woman that was a psychic for, you know, a couple of years. Um, and I just call her now the demon whisperer. Like she just brought havoc into my life because I bought into it. This was five years ago or so now. And just the stuff she would say to people that I know and to me. And I was sort of like, nah, she gets it all right. It's all good. And she was tarot and, you know, that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. And f like highly irresponsible in the information that she would share because you're in a vulnerable state and you'd say it. And most of it wasn't true anyway. It didn't turn out that way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you could act on something like that and fucking destroy your life or be traumatized or, you know. Now, yeah. that's probably a bad rap for all of it, you know, but I just, after that, I was just like, no, nah, yeah. I, I don't. Not for you. Yeah, no. I like, I like it as a tool. Yeah. I like, I'm a designer, I'm into symbolism, I like the, I like it as a tool. Apparently, it's like an interface to your, your, um, subconscious, you know? It's yeah. Okay. Like there's so much in that. Like, just, you could take one of those cards and you can just study it for a, a year, you know? It's just, it's, it's, it's deep. But, yeah, I mean, telling people what to do based on the, on their well, reading. She was a psych. I think if you're using it for your own divination. <laughs> yeah, right? just as a, as a tool, that, you know? But this woman was a psychic and it was just like, she would get a lot right. And so you go, oh, I'm going to buy into this. Yeah. And then it would be, yeah, like, man, yeah, some of the stuff mm. she said to me and people I know, and whew, yeah. I look back on it now going, you should not be speaking to anyone because that's dangerous information. <laughs> oh, no. They're telling see, people that their partner's having an affair and that they should no leave way. them. No way. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. And just would just drop it in. And it's like, yeah, yeah, like, you know, they were having an affair. You see, they're into someone else, blah, blah, blah. And so then you go on a rampage about it and then it ends up not being true. No, you know? that's irresponsible. Like, yeah. That's irresponsible. Um, but um, something else I wanted to, to, to talk to you about, especially the situation that I'm in at the moment, is like between worlds, you know, between identity. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I'm going to close down this shack. Going to keep the podcast going, but it's probably going to change. Obviously, Tom's not here today. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going through the process of um, closing out our business wordplay and it's, you know, going to evolve into something else. And... Uh, how, what's your take on that? Like, through life do we do this? We shed skins. Yeah. Um, Lobster shells, as you were saying. That's right. It's called ectasis, that process. <laughs> I was yeah. going to ask what that word is. That it's an ectasis. It it's, it's when a lobster sheds its shell, yeah. Cool. Uh, but, yeah, what, like, is this, is this by design? Is it, is it our soul's journey? Like, do we just change frequency and then things start changing? Like what? What? How do you explain explain this when it's you go through a dram dramatic change? It's a good question, right? And is it by design? Well, look, every human being on the planet goes through it, so there's got to be some design in it. You know, we live in a. People ask me about what my take is on God. I'm like, I 100 percent believe in God, and they ask, well, how can you prove it? It's like, okay, so if we replace the word God with Creator. We live in a realm where we can create. That was given to us by something. So there's laws which govern this realm, which means it's been created. Laws don't just happen out of nowhere, you know, and so a creator must have created the uh, limitations and the access to be able to create. So that's divine will, like capital W, right? So why do we, why do we go through this? We go through it a lot anyway, right? We just don't really realize it. You know, we might have like a pretty chill year, and then we look back and go, oh, I'm really different 12 months ago. But that was just more of a gentle letting go, the gentle processing. But when we're in these big transitions, the way that I see it is it's like a relationship. So a relationship is like, here's the person I'm with and here's me and these are belief systems. So it's not the person that I miss, right? We're two belief systems and we're going, cool, let's believe together. Mm. And then what happens is then our beliefs start to change and it's like, oh, or oh, these aren't really working anymore. And it's like, okay. And then these beliefs that we mistake as the person go away because we don't know who we are without those beliefs. And that's the grief that comes up. That's the letting go mm -hmm. is these old beliefs, these old structures, this old business. You know, I'm Rick's that ran a podcast that lived in, Mawillan Bar that did all this. And now it's going, okay, it's time to flutter out into the wind. And then I'm left feeling a void or I don't know who I am. Because everything that I had before that I defined as these beliefs is now fading mm -hmm. out. But what happens in this transitional period is that this this part of you, this evolutionary part, we go through birth, uh, evolution, destruction. 
So the disruption that's happening makes way for the creation that is going to be born on the other side of it. But the scary part is the unknown, which to the, the, the ego inspires a lot of fear. But to the soul, that's like, yeah, let's do it, you know? Right. And so... <laughs> Doesn't feel good. <laughs> no, well, yeah, because the re- the ego is going to resist it. In. Yeah, well, and that's to learn surrender and trust. Yeah, you know, that's to learn surrender and trust because when we start to trust and we really start to go, everything's going to be okay. And I've only really hit that in the last year or two, where I'm like, you know what, it's cool. This is this is going to pass, right? There's the old sayings like, "This too shall pass." Which doesn't help when you're fucking breaking up with someone, you're losing your money, you don't know where you're going to live, and, like, you've got $4 in your account. You're like, what the fuck's going on? It's, like, through the eye of the needle. And so we have transcendence and then repetition, and sabotage is the friction point between those two worlds, and sabotage wins when we go back and do the same thing. Transcendence happens when we start to embrace it and go, cool, I'm looking forward to this. Like, what's going to happen mm. from this? I'm, I'm ready for it. You know, and those old parts die with you. And the thing that feels difficult is the resistance to allowing it. It, It's also kind of like this grief of this old person that I was, I feel like. Yeah. It's like a grieving. Like like, like you're saying, you do a lot of plant medicines and I was involved in that, you know, doing that for quite a while. And, you know, I was a very different person in that space. And, um, you know, when your relationship's all tied into that too and it's like... And that all dies away. It's like you, you mourn the relationship, but you're also mourning like this part of yourself that you're not anymore. And you're like, well, who am I without that? Who, yeah. And what am I becoming? And is it, is it, is it an energy shift internally that then is, you know, changing the external environment? Yeah. Or is it just the timeline thing? Is it like, you know, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a wig out. So the external is going to happen in the death of the identity anyway. So that's going to have to shift. When you're, when you oscillate at a different frequency, vibrationally and electromagnetism is going to dictate that different things are going to show up. It has to happen. That's just, that's physics. You mm-hmm. can't argue with that. But how you do that is based on your own perception of what's happening. The, this is the awareness, right? The yeah. awareness that impacts experience. Yeah. Happen. Perspective. Experience is the end part. Yeah. Experience is not really that important because you look at like the burning monk as an example in Vietnam. I think it was Vietnam. Oh yeah, yeah. He sat there that still. Was, whoa, that was gnarly. Imagine yeah, doing that. I couldn't do it. I wouldn't do no it. There's way. no fucking way. No way. I'd be running around looking for a thing of water to dive into, and he just sat there still. So experience can be different, but his perception of the experience was different to what you or I would have. So same experience different perception, different level of awareness. And so when I go through big transitions, now they're not very difficult for me anymore. You know, my father died in February, and I am a big believer that you don't become a man until your father dies. And I had a we did a podcast where I spoke about this, and Jordan Peterson actually says that. And people are disagreeing with me when their fathers haven't died. I know you can have a metaphorical death, and it can be an ego thing, and you can be, and I'm like, you motherfuckers don't know what you're talking about. That everyone whose father had died agreed with me. What What did you notice? Like what when was he the died? Sh- yeah, yeah. So I'll, yeah, I'll get to that. So it's like I thought I fully encapsulated what it is to be a man, and then he died, and I realized, fuck. Okay, These, there was another level to go to. So when your father's around, whether you have whether you're in contact with him or not, and I don't care what anyone says whose father hasn't died, you don't know what you're talking about. Only when your father dies will you know what it's like as a man because there's a subconscious bond and security with your father there, regardless of whether you're in contact or not. When he dies, that gets broken. Whatever comes up from childhood that's frozen in time gets released for you to process. And that's what happened to me. So I had a lot of resentment still because I blamed him for what he did rather than seeing him for who he was. And there was a... He went to jail when I was five. Um, and for, um, tax evasion. Oh my fuck, tax evasion, show your boots up. Get it done. Like, fuck the government, you know? <laughs> and so, like, <laughs> just put it yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he was doing some stuff and they offered him a deal to keep half the money if he pled guilty and he wouldn't do it. And so we ended up losing everything. He went to prison and then he was chasing his tail for the rest of his life trying to make it back. And before he died, I resented him for that because I'm like, why wouldn't you just plead guilty and, like, 
you know, take the money and look after your family again. But after he died, that went away. And I was like, oh, man, I would have done the same thing because I'm not going to sell out because he actually wasn't doing anything illegal. They brought in retrospective legislation which backdated to make mm. it illegal. So he's just, he's just speaking his truth. He, was, he, he stood for his, his name. He wanted to be his integrity. Yeah, he stood for his name. And I was like, wow, like he stood by his name and he couldn't, wouldn't sell out. And mm. that's like me. I, won't, I wouldn't sell out. There's no way. I'd be like, no. Nah. It was like um, getting a jab. You know, yeah. I was like, no fucking way. I'm like, no chance. You can fuck off with that. I don't care. You come yeah. to my door and try to take me down with it, right? I'll take as many of you motherfuckers yeah. as possible. I don't care. It was it was tough too, really. That that whole thing. Like I like we lost, you know, like we lost a lot of business. Yeah, really you're saying that yeah, off yeah. camera, yeah. So so you know to stick it out. It's good on you. Yeah. I, I Same to you. That. Congratulations. I Thanks and likewise. <laughs> you know, I was so convicted in it. I'm like, that shit's not going in my body. No. And I don't care. Like, I don't. I don't. I just was like, no. He was like, it's just not going to happen. Mm. Yeah. And so, it was walking around through that. Because I was kind of aware of the agendas going on anyway before that. You know, it's funny, like, now conspiracy theorists are, like, the best source of information. Just know what's going to happen next. And it was like, I'm like, no, like, you know. And some people were saying, you know, um, that they've got homes and this and that they've got to work on. And I'm like, sure. I, and I sympathize with people that have had to make that choice. But, you know, at some point you got to go. What's more important, my own sovereignty, my own, mm. you know, integrity, my own conviction, or a fucking mortgage? But yeah. they're going to try to take office anyway in a few years. Yeah, well, and, like, going back to that point you're making there about, about your dad standing in his integrity and, and men being men, um, I was quite surprised with that whole, you know, thing that went on. I was like, where are all the... Where's the strong women? Where's all the men around talking about this? Because... Yeah. All these tradies and and everyone, you know, alpha male type archetypes, yeah, um, just Weak. just not just folding yeah, on it. Weak. So, yeah, it's it's um, yeah, yeah it's, it's weak. I only know one of my close friends that got it, um, and it was to keep a job. And I was like, dude, just wait, just wait, just wait. Like I pulled mates aside that were considering, and I was like, don't you fucking get it? You will regret it. Wait fucking sort it out somewhere else where you can make money anywhere you know but this is where it was like it was a real test of like compliance of people how willfully compliant are you i think i wore a mask twice and that's because i had to get on a flight to go see my dad mm-hmm. in sydney that was sick you know that was that was pretty much it yeah um and even then i was still like taking it off when i was on the flight and um you know that was that was the only time yeah that was it when I had to really do something, I had to compromise. Yeah, it's uh, that really showed a lot about people's character. I feel, you know, in a way, like what what their beliefs were and what they were willing to, you know, if you want to do it and you and and you have the belief of doing it, then go and do it. But then the people that had the belief of not wanting to do it and then it went to it anyway, anyway yeah. it just shows your your, your kind of your character. A hundred percent, and it's yeah. you know, I saw that and I was I was blown away by that same thing, like these quote-unquote alpha male archetypes and i stress the word archetype because like if they're a real alpha male they're not going to fold to that Mm. they're not going to do that they're going to be like right how do we work around this and i i didn't do it and i said no i'm not doing it there's no way they could have dragged me to a camp and i would have no there's no way yeah and i never will get it and i tell people don't get it because it's bad and now that's look how it's playing out yeah i've I've, yeah i know a lot of people around me that have Either got really, really ill, or there's been deaths around the place, and yeah, so it's it's um or keep getting sick. Yeah, but then they um, go, oh, I got sick, and like, well, it'd be so much worse if I didn't have the jab. It's like you're sick yeah. because of the jab. Too. Yeah, you know? so you got to one, you got to wonder. But um, it just uh, you know, it was a kind of final piece on this. What do you think the solutions are? Like, you know, talking about this, it's um issues around uh masculinity and society and, and what that does to society what are the solutions how do you counter this what's going on because this pendulum's got to swing the other way right that's it what i was talking about andrew tate but yeah. like how do you do it in a healthy way yeah what's and that's a good point because i was going to say what's the solution now um you know people are moving towards the red pill in the manosphere you heard of that and the what manosphere i don't know the manosphere bit but uh. so it's feminism for men Right, so typically it's like hating the opposite sex. I've been hurt. I don't want to go okay. near women, right? And it's like misogyny, misandry, 
Right, this injury is the hatred of men. Why have we got ex- all these extremes? It's just... It's yeah, it's it's ridiculous. And, you know, the red pill stuff is usually full of, like, just degenerates that just want to fuck women and that's use them for, for sex and that's it. So the solution that I believe is so... What I want to restore is relationships, right? So childhood trauma, then people being raised by the state and broken families, they're called broken families for a reason. And that's, uh, that's, um, orchestrated and the architecture is by the state to do that, to raise kids. Like, look at, you know, the trans movements on kids influencing them at mm-hmm. schools at the moment. Like, if you want to be trans as an adult, go for it. Yeah. Like, have at it. They'd fucking leave the kids alone. Yeah, don't mess with their heads. Yeah. Like, they're seven, eight years old. They don't know what they are. Would have been a ninja turtle back yeah. in the day. And then, okay, cool. Get a cell, a shell sewn on me or something like that. Or, you know, tattooed. And some people have done this. Like, a, they're things they used to blindfolds with their eyes cut out. You know, like it would hide their identity. You know, like I'm like Michelangelo, and you can't tell because I've got an orange strip across my face. So, the first thing is, is like for men, they have to transcend their boy psychology into man psychology. That's the first thing, right? Make a living, work on your nervous system. You know, do the inner work to transcend that. You know, treat women with respect. Like they're not to be used and abused, like the red pill suggests, right? Like Andrew Tate's done before as well. Mm. They're not good role models. Don't look for those role models. You know, when you get to a certain age, there's, there's sort of arguments for and against this, right? So a lot of the people that are in this trad culture, like trad Christian, Catholic, whatever, they're saying get married in 2021. I'm not really a proponent of that because a man's brain doesn't finish developing until they're 35. But I would say adopt a notion of celibacy for a while, right? Don't go sleeping around. Don't create the women that you then despise. Because women can't pair bond after a while if they sleep with too many men. It reduces their ability to pair bond, right? Oxytocin uptake and things like that. I won't get into that now because this would be addressed at men. And so that was, I guess, one of the things sexual liberation and feminism created that as well. That helped the breakdown. And so... With men, it's like, look at your boy psychology. You have to be around good men. I can't stress this enough. Like, this is not my original discovery. Brotherhood is so important. When you get around the right men, you don't, you stop needing women so much, right? So in my inner circle, I don't let men in that are chasing women all the time because they're pleasure driven, they're untrustworthy, and they will betray you. 100%. They'll betray you to get laid for a night. Mm. They're not brothers that I want to go and do hard things with because they will turn on you in a second. I've had other guys like that that try to slime their way in with my, with my partner or something like that. And it's just like, okay, I'll see if I can knock him off and take what's his. Like, I'm not interested in competing in that way with men because it's pathetic and it's slimy and it's simpy kind of grossness, right? Yeah. Yeah. So transcend boy psychology into man psychology understand like you develop a connection with god too or spirit whatever you want to call it you know embrace your masculinity for you know your analytical nature your logical na- nature your toughness do hard things go do jujitsu get schooled get hammered you know like i've seen a, a legion of men that have had overprotective devouring mothers that become soft and you know they can't make it through difficult things and so find what's difficult and keep facing that front on treat marriage as a covenant it doesn't matter if you're, you know, 20 or whether you're 40 or whatever. It's never too late, right? Like, I'm 40, and now I'm at the point where I'm like, it's husband and father time for me. I've done everything else. I've traveled the world. I've made millions of dollars. I'm super successful. I've done everything I want to do. Husband and father is it for me. And so, can I provide? Yes. Can I protect? Yes. Can I take care of a woman? Yes. Can I allow her to be a mother to fully flourish in that where she wouldn't have to work the entire time? Yes. That's perfect, right? That's a good balance if that's what someone wants. So treat that as a good thing. Find purpose. Find brothers. You have to figure out why you're here, what you want to do, and what you want to build. Instead of playing video games, chasing women, just trying to get laid, you become a slave to pleasure. And I was like that. My nickname was the Wolf of Wall Street. So it was like women were a conquest to me. I haven't treated women amazingly in the past. That's how I know exactly why I'll never do that again because I'm not proud of what I've done it before. You know, and I think that's an important aspect. As a man, you have to acknowledge that and own your shit. I wasn't born into some perfect family. No, I was very abusive. I haven't treated people well in the past. I ended up in prison when I was 19. Mm. You know, like I've got a checkered history, but I own it. So no one can own it against me. And I know by virtue of who I don't want to be and who I'll never be again, that marriage, family, honoring women, transcending your boy psychology 
is the way to becoming a man. And so I can hopefully guide men to not make the same mistakes that I did as a product of a broken society. And so fix relationships, fix men, help them transcend boy psychology and find purpose and meaning in the world. Then we can protect our women and children. We don't need to protect women because they're weak. We protect them because they're important. And that's the most important thing to look at, you know, and yeah, that's probably a good place to sort of wrap that bit up. Yeah, and that's good. So on that, uh, where can people find you? Yeah. And have you got anything coming up? That's uh, interesting. So yes. Pure Jaguar, as you called me at the start, is, <laughs> you know, things usually finish the way they start. Pure Jaguar, um, nothing. I mean, I'm doing one-on-one stuff at the moment in private mentorships where I teach my method to people. So I teach them how to open the mind, dissolve the trauma for people and help people shift. So I'm teaching that to people at the moment. So I don't have any group stuff going on at the moment, just one-on-ones with that and okay. just doing work with one-on-one with men as well. Cool. Do you work with women? Yeah. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. I work with everyone. It's okay. just that because it's more geared, I think that you fix men, the problems in society will stop. You fix men, the relationship issues will stop. If men learn how to hold their women, like men want to fix women all the time, and I've been guilty of this, but I can tell you this, it's like a little insight. If your woman's angry at you and you listen, to address her feelings, make sense, yes, I understand you're feeling this, I'm sorry, can I just hold you for a minute? And watch how different your relationship will become just from that thing instead of going, well, hang on, if I provide the evidence to make sure that she's wrong, maybe that'll fix it. It's like, here's the evidence, like she doesn't care about that. Deal with the feelings and then deal with the evidence after that. And women want to be held because at that point it's like their little girl's going off and they're almost, they're subconsciously going, you know, father me, look after me, be a man and take care of me and hold me, wrap me up, make me feel safe. And then I'll get over it and I'll just, it's much easier. It's not a problem to fix. It's just something to understand. Mm. And so, yeah, I work with, work with anyone um, around that. It's just that mm. if I fix men, the problems in society will usually yeah. go away. So that so that's your ma- your main channel is it Instagram? Yeah, it's my only channel really. Your only channel? I tried Facebook and other things, but I. Saw what about TikTok? It. Yeah, I've got a TikTok account, <laughs> but it was just like I think I posted like six times, and I'm like, okay. yeah, and, uh, it's not working for me. I tried Twitter as well, but I gave up after five minutes because I couldn't be bothered. Okay. Too much. It's too, too much. much. It's too much. Yeah. yeah, Instagram's worked for me. Okay, it works for me. I like it. It's that's what I was thinking. Okay, very good. Yeah. Simple. Yeah, pure Jaguar. Um, P-U-R-E-J-U-R. Okay. Um, and for us, for, uh, for the Design on Purpose podcast, you can find us on Instagram at Design on Purpose. And you can find me on my personal Instagram at Rick Sleedy. Uh, we're also on TikTok, Design on Purpose on TikTok. Uh, so I post the clips up on there too. But, um, yeah, that's where we can find us. And uh, thanks for listening. Thank thanks, you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks very much. Enjoyed it.